Over the last few weeks, many of you will have got one of these, DJI Mini 2, the Mini 3, or the Mini 3 Pro. And for some of you, this may be your first GPS controlled drone. And if that's the case, this video is for you. Hello, I'm Ian and I play with drones and I thought I'd do a full beginner's guide on setting up your new DJI Mini 2, 3 or 3 Pro today and give you some quick guidance on getting it up in the air and more importantly, keeping it up there. So generally, if you crash one of these, it's gonna require a DJI repair job, that's not cheap. So not crashing is pretty essential. But anyway, before we can get out flying, we need to get everything set up. So without further ado, let's get it set up. Okay, so first off, let's quickly go through what you get actually in the box. If you have got the basic drone and remote package, then you'll have the drone body and the remote and a battery. You'll also have a couple of spare props and a tiny little screwdriver, uh, which you'd use if you were replacing the, uh, the, the props, but you'd only really replace them if they'd got damage, if you hit a tree or crash, which hopefully, of course, you won't. Uh, the Flymore combo comes with the extra carry case, a couple of extra spare batteries, and the charging hub, and a few extra spare props. So, take a little look at the, uh, the drone itself. Um, you see, first of all, you have this very large transparent clip. You undo it from the bottom and unclip it like that. You really want to keep this uh, gimbal guard in place whenever you pack the drone away. You can see how delicate and vulnerable the camera uh, gimbal is, so obviously the clip keeps it all very protected. Uh, the gimbal is designed this way so that it obviously can move, or more importantly, it'll actually stay locked on the subject as the drone is twisting and turning uh, in flight, and that's how you get such super smooth uh, video. So it really is an amazing little bit of engineering. On the Mini 3 Pro, you will have uh, forward and rear obstacle avoidance. Uh, you can see the little sensors there and there. Uh, you haven't got that on the Mini 3, but both models have got downward vision system. Um, the Mini 3 Pro has actually got downward obstacle avoidance as well as the vision system. And that'll actually just help uh, keep the drone in the same position when GPS signal is weak. Um, the legs fold out, get them in the right order because otherwise they get a little bit tangled. But uh, once you've got them folded out, uh, you can see pretty much how the drone will fly. Around the back, you've got the micro SD card slot, the USB-C slot, and uh, the battery will just slot in like that. There's only one way to get it in, and it clicks nice and loud. Um, DJI don't supply chargers now, so you're going to need your own charger that's at least 30 watts. So a typical mobile phone charger may take hours to charge the battery up. Um, if it's a faster charger, then you'll probably get the battery charged in just under an hour and you'll be able to see the lights, charging lights move a lot faster when it's charging. So you can charge uh, the battery inside the drone um, and obviously you can use a power bank as well, uh, being USB-C, so if you're camping or out in the field. Uh, depending on the strength of the power bank, it'll take between one and three hours to recharge the battery. Um, if you've got the Fly More Combo, of course, you can charge the batteries actually in the charging hub as well. Um, so very, very useful that, of course, because you'll be able to have some batteries on charge whilst you're still flying with the other battery. And then finally, around the back, as I said, we've got the slot for the micro SD card uh, for recording your videos and photos. Filming 4K video is an awful lot of data to record on a card, and you're gonna need one with a very high write speed, a speed of around 80 to 100 megabits per second write speed. In the video notes, I always have a link to decent cards on Amazon, uh, and certainly they're the ones that I use, and I've never actually had uh, any problem using them when filming. Um, I do also find the slots are so fiddly, um, a little pair of tweezers is often a useful thing to carry around with you. But anyway, um, let's have a quick look at the remote controls. So if you have got the RC package, then you're gonna have the remote with the screen built in. Um, if you've got the other uh, RC N1 remote, then it will look like that, and your phone will clip on top and plug in via the tiny little USB-C, um, or uh, you've got the um, lightning connector if you've got an iPhone. And uh, obviously the phone will then sit horizontally there, and that's where you will view the Fly app. Uh, you've got to download the DJI Fly app from dji.com slash downloads. Otherwise, the layout of the remotes are pretty similar. Uh, you've also got the two main control sticks to, remote, uh, to control the movement of the drone itself. Um, you've got around the back, you've got the camera gimbal wheel 
that will allow the uh, gimbal to move up and down. And you've also got a couple of customizable buttons that you can um, set. I think default to just changing the uh, gimbal from uh, landscape through to 90 degree vertical. Um, on the front, you have also got a pause button uh, and a return to home button if you press and hold it. And you've also got the uh, flight mode button, which allows you to toggle between cine, normal, and, uh, and sports mode. And then of course, you've also got the um, power button as well. Um, on the RC remote, you have got the ability to uh, press record or take uh, still photos there. Now, on the back of the N1 remote, you've only got the one uh, toggle wheel and you don't have, you have a, a toggle button that swaps modes, but you still have to press the shutter button on screen. So um, slight difference between uh, the remote controls there. But for the rest of this, I'm gonna show you the RC package because um, frankly, I, I'm hoping you'll have got this one because I really do think it's the best remote that you can use. So as I said, you've got this uh, toggle between cine, normal, and sports mode. You're always gonna take off in normal mode, um, even if you've got it switched to a different setting. Uh, but you can then switch to cine mode or sports mode once you're up in the air. Cine mode will slow down both the uh, drone's movement and also the camera gimbal's movement, so that helps you get really smooth cinematic video. Whilst flicking it over to sports mode will simply make the drone fly much faster and it will also affect the speed of the, uh, the gimbal and, and the camera as well. So depending on what it is you're trying to film, Normally I tend to use sports mode when I just want to fly out to get somewhere fast. Um, and then you can flick to cine mode or normal mode uh, to slow things down and, uh, and smooth things out. Sports mode is very, very easy to crash. Um, literally the slightest stick movement and the drone will move an awful lot. So really you want to use sports mode uh, with care and uh, stick to normal or cine mode when you're actually doing uh, some filming. And then um, underneath you have got a, another USB-C slot to charge up the, the remote control. And under here you've got a little flap. And in there you'll also find a little slot for another micro SD card, which allows you to record the screen when you're actually flying. So first off, you wanna get everything charged up. Uh, as I said, the batteries are gonna take around an hour, even when using the charging hub. The, um, the charging hub will charge the batteries in sequence. So if you've got three batteries, it'll take three hours to charge them up. When you plug it in, you're gonna see that uh, it'll automatically start charging the most charged battery uh, in sequence. Um, DJI call them intelligent batteries, and, and they are, to be honest. They do look after themselves. They'll start to auto-discharge after a few days if they're not used. Uh, lithium batteries don't really like being stored at full capacity. But you can always check uh, how, whether or not they're fully charged with a quick press of the power button, and it'll show you this one's half charged. It's on two lights. And the charging hub, not a lot of people, a lot of people miss this. There's a tiny little button there. You press that, and it will light up and you can see there how well the batteries are charged there as well. So that's a useful little thing to uh, indicate which are the charged batteries and which are not if you're swapping around and flying during the day. But once they're charged up, you're gonna need to power everything up and crucially get the firmware updated. Now it is always better to do this inside where it is warm and uh, where you've also got good internet as it can easily take over half an hour to get everything uh, updated. Uh, make sure the legs are unfolded and that the gimbal guard is off. The gimbal goes through a little startup procedure and it'll jam if the guard is still in place. So with the battery still uh, in, of course, you do a quick release and then a long, and you'll then hear it click and start doing its little startup. Uh, you do exactly the same on the remote control. So again, a quick and then a long, and again, it will start up. And it just takes a few seconds to start up. The drone's gonna try and do a satellite lock. It obviously won't do a very good satellite lock inside. And the screen will start up the Fly app automatically for you. If you've got the um, N1 remote, then obviously you're gonna have to hook your phone on, open up the DJI Fly app, and start that up as well in order for you to see what's going on and to update the firmware. Either way though, it's important to make sure you complete the setup questions the first time you fire up the um, RC remote uh, so it knows how to connect to your home Wi-Fi and how to update itself and to download the, the firmware. You're also going to have to enter your own email address. Now look, beforehand, 
I think you should go to dji.com and sign up there to create your free account. This is the same email address that you should enter in the flyer. And if you don't, the drone will be stuck in beginner mode and it will not fly very high or very far at all. But it's also a way of syncing your flight logs, which I can come on to later. Then just let it guide you through the update uh, process for the firmware. If it is not the first time you've switched it on, then you'll have to enable uh, the Wi-Fi on the remote. And you can do that by just dragging down from the top of the screen and you've got the little Wi-Fi symbol there. And if you need to reconnect to a different Wi-Fi network, then you just tap the little nut symbol over there and it will open up the main system settings and you can go into the network settings and uh, set up the new Wi-Fi and password there. Once the firmware is downloaded, it will pretty much just take care of itself. It'll uh, download, unpack it and install it itself. And once it's all updated and the batteries are charged up, you're then going to be ready to take it out and get flying. But before that, I need to take you through the uh, main features of the fly app so you know what's happening whilst you're flying. And I'm going to do this inside because frankly, it's still freezing cold outside. And to be clear, I definitely don't recommend you actually fly indoors. Um, you can power up and connect without starting the props. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of flying indoors. The GPS signal is always very weak, easy to get confused, and if it moves about, as soon as it hits a wall, the prop's gonna stop and it's just gonna fall to the ground and crash and you could break your gimbal. So, once everything is updated, you should be seeing this, the camera view of the drone where you can see the live feed from the drone's camera on screen. It's got so much information. So, as I said, I, have to need, I kind of have to go through that now. So first up, top left, shows the flight mode that you're in. This is normally gonna match the switch on the remote unless you left the switch in sports or cine mode the last time you were flying. Next, you've got the status bar, which shows your, the current flight status or any warning messages. And you can tap it to expand any messages, like if you have to uh, calibrate the compass. Next over, you've got the battery information. Now this is a really important bit of uh, the screen to keep an eye on as it shows how much time you've got left on the battery. But it's really important to know that the time shown remaining is actually the time until the battery is completely exhausted. The automatic low battery return to home will kick in earlier than the time that's indicated on that uh, upper uh, display. Next along, you've got the video downlink strength. Now this is how strong the video stream is, which is not quite the same as the remote signal itself. And that's one of the reasons you can still initiate a return to home even when you've lost video signal. Next over, you've got the obstacle avoidance system, which only shows obviously on the Mini 3 Pro. Um, the upper element is showing the forward system and the lower half of that little symbol is the rear system. Uh, if it's not white, then it's not good. Uh, red means the system is switched off or not available, which can happen if it's too dark or if you are in sports mode. Next over is the satellite lock, which shows how many satellites you are locked onto. Now, you really don't wanna be flying with less than 15, and ideally, you wanna wait until you've got at least 18 to 20 to make sure the home point is set and that you don't suffer any drift. Next over are the three dots of the main system settings. Now, in truth, I could easily spend another 20 minutes going through all of these settings. So for now, I'm gonna keep things brief and just highlight the important ones. When you tap the three dots, it opens up a screen with five tabs. Now the first tab is safety, and this is where you set things like the return to home height, which is the height the drone will come back at if it loses signal. So it generally needs to be higher than any obstacle or tree that's around you. Uh, you also set uh, things like the maximum height the drone can fly and how far away it can fly. Again, you wanna keep the maximum height probably at 120 meters or 400 feet, as any higher is usually illegal in most countries. On the Mini 3 Pro, you'll also set the APAS, or pilot assistance settings here, on how you want it to behave when the drone comes up towards obstacles. Bypass mode will do its best to get around obstacles, but can also make the drone a little bit more jumpy. Uh, brake mode is usually the safest and i found provides the best flight experience. So that's the setting that I tend to leave it in. You can also set the return to home option for lost signal. Now, in truth, these things are pretty smart and if they lose signal, they will automatically reverse and try and regain connection before then turning and flying in a straight line back to the takeoff or home point. So for that reason, I keep this in the default setting of return to home rather than hover or land. 
If you're over water, you defo do not want it to be automatically landing by itself. And if it hovers, then it's you that has to move in order to try and regain contact, uh, which may not always be possible. So for me, I leave it in the default of return to home. Now the next tab is control. And here's where you'll set metric or imperial units for feet or meters. The rest I would actually leave as default, but for reference, this is where you will also amend the smoothness settings for the sticks and gimbal, which I cover in another video on the advanced gimbal settings. The next tab over is the main camera settings. And again, I could do a whole video on this. So for now, I would suggest you actually look through, but you pretty much leave things in default for now. Although you may want to ensure that you save as RAW as well as JPEG if you like editing photos in Photoshop and the like. The transmission tab, I'd pretty much leave alone. And to be honest, it's the last tab that has a useful setting to force check for firmware updates. But other than that, again, you can pretty much leave all the settings uh, as they are. So to jump back to the main camera view, just tap the left side and the settings will then close. So below those three dots, you have got the main controls for changing the photo and video modes. It's just, it's that little symbol just above the red uh, shutter button. Um, so as I said, this is where you're gonna change from stills to video mode. It's also where you access the various intelligent flight modes and the quick shots and master shots for the Mini 3 Pro, uh, along with panoramas and the slow motion mode, again, for the Mini 3 Pro only. The Mini 3 hasn't got a, a slow-mo mode. Here you can also adjust the zoom, uh, but to be honest, I'm not a massive fan of the zoom as it's digital. So to me, you might as well do some cropping in post editing rather than try and force a zoom here. But obviously that is very much personal preference. Below that, you have the big red shutter button, which uh, you tap to start uh, and stop recording video or to take still pictures. If it's grayed out, you probably have forgotten to put in a micro SD card. Below that, you've got a little playback button. And again, in truth, I very rarely use this in flight, certainly, because when you're flying, to me, you should be concentrating on the drone and not browsing the previous pictures. So save that for when it's landed. But along the bottom right are the filming and picture settings. And again, this is pretty much a complete separate video, uh, which I've already done. So I will link to that above. But briefly, this is where you set the frames per second, the resolution, and you can also hop into the manual pro mode by tapping the little symbol on the uh, very extreme bottom far right. And this is where you can then set manual uh, values for pretty much all the parameters. But as I said, um, for now, uh, let's skip through it. Uh, watch the other video that I'll link to if you want more details on that. Then moving along to the left, you have got the flight indicators showing you how high and far you are and how fast you're flying and how fast you're rising or descending. Remember the height is relative to the takeoff point and if you are on a hill, it is not gonna reflect the actual height of the drone itself. And then over on the far left, you've got the map and this really is a very useful little bit of the screen and you can choose to expand the map by tapping the corner and Personally, I actually find even more useful is a little radar screen that you get by tapping the tiny little lower right icon of the map. And then finally, halfway up on the left, you have got the auto takeoff button, which then changes to the auto land button once you're airborne. And I'm gonna go through that in a little bit more when I go back outside. That, people, is the camera view screen. Loads and loads and loads of information there. And you really wanna explore these settings when you're out flying, which is why it's good to have the first few flights, I think, in a wide open setting, away from uh, other people, and give yourself plenty of time to go through uh, these settings on your own. Now, if you're in the UK, you're also gonna to need to register yourself at uh, registerdrones.caa.co.uk, or you can just uh, Google uh, Register Drone UK. Once you've done that, you're gonna be good to fly. So. Let's get outside and get up in the air. Right, so a fair bit to do inside before you get ready for your first flight, but hopefully that will all make sense. Um, after updating the firmware, getting to know the fly app display and making sure all the batteries and the controller are charged up, we're finally ready for our first flight. Um, first thing, double check that you've got your micro SD card inserted. You wouldn't believe the number of times I get up in the sky and it's be told no SD card. Uh, so that's one thing to check. Um, these things are actually easy to fly, but they're also quite easy to crash if you don't watch out. 
So for your first flyer, I would definitely recommend you find somewhere far away from people, trees and buildings. By all means, head out with a friend, but I wouldn't recommend a bunch of mates because they will just end up distracting you and you could well end up uh, crashing it in front of everybody, which wouldn't be good. Um, when you find your place, make sure the area you're flying in is not restricted. So it's at least five kilometers or three miles from any airport. If you're in the UK, then check out the Drone Scene site, which is built to work on any phone. I'll put a link below and it will show you automatically whether you're flying in a good or bad place. Uh, like I said, I'll post a link below. I've done a separate video on how to make use of it. It's free and it really is a brilliant, brilliant uh, site and program to make use of. Anyway, when you're ready to take off, take a quick look around for trees and especially uh, power lines. Make sure it's not windy and that no people are nearby and there are no dogs that can run over and get in your way. Dogs, as you will know, any regular uh, watcher of my videos, dogs go mad at drones and uh, they can really hurt their eyes or snout on the spinning prop, so no dogs. Anyway, set it down on a flat surface or a table. Uh, try and avoid car roofs or metal tables as a lot of metal nearby can mess up the compass. Uh, make sure when you take off it's facing away from you uh, as this is important for the movement of the drone to correspond with the movement of the sticks. Um, I'll go through that a bit more in a minute or so when it's up. So as ever it's a quick and then a long press. Hold until you hear it clicking. Let's set it down. And same with the remote. Now you're going to be waiting for a good satellite connection. Um, you're really waiting for that home point has been updated uh, message. You want at least 17, 20 satellites is good to stop uh, the drone drifting when it should be stationary. So uh, keep an eye on the uh, sat count up the top. So once you've got sufficient sat lock and you can tap on the satellite uh, uh, icon at the top right and you can actually see you've got good strong satellite here. What are we on? 21 to, uh, satellites. So. You've got two ways of taking off, uh, manual or automatic, but in truth, both are pretty much just as easy. You can press and hold the, you tap the little takeoff icon and then you press and hold. As soon as you let go, it'll power up and just go up about one and a half meters or uh, six feet. Uh, once it's up, it'll just hover and it'll just wait for you to uh, do something. Uh, manual way is very easy as well. Let's just bring it back down. As I said, manual way is also very easy. With the drone powered on, with the lights on, with the props off, you're going to bring the two sticks into the five o'clock and seven o'clock position. And then the, uh, so if we do that, and there you go. And it's just waiting again with the prop starting. And then what we've got to do is lift the left stick up. And again, and the moment you let go, again, it's just sitting there waiting for you to do something. And this is probably one of the most important things to remember when you're flying. As long as you've got good GPS from above, um, you can let go of the sticks at any time. And the Mini will stop moving and it'll just sit there stationary and wait until you tell it to do something. So it's a very useful trick if you're getting a little bit confused or if something's not going right, just let go and it'll just sit there. So now is probably a good time to get to know the sticks. Um, there are three different stick modes that you can set in the settings. The default is mode two, and I really recommend you just leave it at the default, mode two, unless you've got a real good reason, as this is what is most commonly used by everybody. Uh, changing the stick mode is a bit like swapping the clutch pedal to the right of the accelerator in a car. You just wouldn't. So um, in the default mode two, left stick is literally up and down. Again, just Gentle movements at first. And then uh, the left stick, left to right, is literally spinning. So you can see here, it spins to the left. And if I push the stick to the right, it spins to the right. So that is what the left stick is doing. Literally up, down, spin to the left, and spin to the right. The right stick is literally up, it's forwards, down is backwards, left is move left, and right is move right. All fairly straightforward stuff. You probably want to take a bit of time and see how the sticks behave and what effect each stick has, because 
uh, a subtle movement can often have quite a significant effect on the drone itself. I have done a separate video on how to smooth out the stick movements and if they're a little bit jumpy for now, uh, don't worry too much. You can easily change the settings and smooth things down. For now, we need to just get used to how the drone is behaving. I do find less is more with stick movements. Um, it's easy to forget or mix up uh, which stick is doing what. So I find a good habit is to lightly tap the stick and make sure the drone does what you want it to do. And of course, this is especially important if the drone isn't facing away from you. If it's pointing sideways or facing towards you, then you have to try and put yourself in the pilot's position in the drone itself, because all the stick movements are relative to the drone itself and not you. So here, it will move to the left. And when I move the stick to the right, it moves to the right. But now, if I actually spin the drone round, you can see obviously it has the opposite effect. Now, if I put the stick right, it's going to the left. And if I put the stick to the left, it moves to the right. So you really need a little bit of practice about that. Having a move in different directions when it's not facing away from you is the one thing that is going to really catch you out. So actually a good way to practice is to try and do a figure of eight. And it's actually way harder than you think, but it is a brilliant way to start understanding how the sticks move and eventually it will become second nature and you will end up with much smoother video. So once you've had a little bit of practice, then you probably want to get up and uh, get up high and enjoy the view. After all, that is what owning a drone is all about. And on this uh, particularly frosty, snowy day, uh, absolutely stunning, stunning views. Um, in most countries, it's illegal to fly higher than about 400 feet or 120 meters. And that's because most manned aircraft can't fly below 500 feet. So you have this nice safety margin. In truth, I find flying around 150 feet or probably about 40 meters, 50 meters is pretty much bang on. You're going to be higher than most buildings and trees and you're going to get brilliant views of everything. So 50 meters is a really nice height to, uh, to keep flying. Now you can see down in the bottom left of your uh, screen, you have got uh, the altitude, the height. Remember that the rules are all about the height between the drone and the ground itself. Whereas your display is telling you what the height is relative to takeoff point. So just keep that in mind. If you're on a hill, especially if you're on a steep hill and you're flying off from the top of the hill, you actually do need to descend to keep that 400 foot minimum, um, minimum or maximum height. And then when you're up high, just get used to the controls. Keep the drone close by, certainly within visual line of sight, and don't try and do too much on your first flight. Uh, be very careful about flying near trees. Trees will suck the signal out, make the signal drop off quite quickly. And also, of course, if you're flying around trees or buildings, if you can't see the drone, then the signal will probably drop as well and you could lose collect, uh, connection. And if that happens, don't panic because it will go into reverse initially to try and re-establish connection. And if it still can't, then it will go into an automatic return to home. But of course, it's going to do a straight line back to the home point that was recorded when you first took off. And that's where you want to make sure that the return to home altitude that you set in the settings is higher than any obstacle you've got in the area where you'll be flying. And finally, my last bit of advice would be to keep an eye on the battery indicator and get it back well before the low battery alarms kick in. The flight time remaining that you see there is the total flight time remaining until battery depletion. It's actually shorter than that in practice. If you would tap the battery uh, sorry, the, the flight time symbol up there, it will expand and you see three separate times. The top time is until the return to home is going to kick in. So that is actually the only uh, the remaining flight time you've got. Uh, then you've got the next one is until forced landing. That's where basically it will start to descend by itself. You can temporarily override that by pushing the left stick up. But the moment you let go of that left stick, it will continue to descend again. And then at the bottom, you've got the until battery depleted and that is when it will force land wherever it is and there's nothing you can do about it. Right when you were finally ready to land you've got two ways of doing it again you can either manually land it or you can use the automatic uh, little icon on the left just as when you took off you tap that and you press and hold 
and as soon as you let go, it'll go into landing mode. You do want to make sure that you are over somewhere flat and because uh, the landing isn't precise. It can be a good foot or two uh, out from where you actually took off from. So a little table might not be uh, wide enough. So it can be useful to learn how to hand catch as well. I've done another video on that. Um, it's not something I'd recommend for your first flight because it'd be very easy to hurt your fingers basically or have it flip out and fall over. But we'll show you how to do that. Basically, you're gonna do your uh, left stick down to get it into landing mode, and you're just gonna hold your flat hand out flat as if you're feeding a horse. You keep that left stick down until the motor's shut off. The moment it lands on your hand, you keep your hand still. So it thinks it's hit the ground. As long as that left stick is still down, the motors will shut down. My advice would be to practice whenever the weather is good because you will get better at flying and then you'll be able to take better pictures and video. This is actually why I often think aerial photography and videography is much harder than standard photography because you have to concentrate on so many things in addition to just taking the picture or video. So the more of the flying and control of the drone that becomes second nature, the easier things become. Anyway, look, I've done my very best to keep things as short as possible today, uh, despite the dogs going crazy in the snow. Um, I have done loads of other videos and tutorials on how to get smoother flights, how to fly in freezing conditions like these, along with other videos like what happens when the battery runs right down. And I'll put some links to those here uh, in the video notes below. Um, hopefully this has been useful for you and you'll get the most out of your new piece of equipment. Um, like I said, avoid crashing at all costs. Take it easy, don't push the battery, what could possibly go wrong? Anyway, if you like this, give me a little thumbs up, always helps the video along, and wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Until next time, with crazy dogs going everywhere, have fun, happy flying. <laughs>